long, long ago. In a land whose borders touched the very rivers of Egypt. Stretching from the broad banks of the Red Sea all the way to the dusky walls of Damascus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if I forget thee, O oh, Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed by Rome, by the iron fist of Titus, prophesied and foretold by Hamashiach himself. And according to Josephus, the Jerusalem demise was etched in the stars by various signs and wonders ignored by the children of Judah. A star, resembling a sword, which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. Thus, before the Jews' rebellion and before those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day of the month of Nisan. And at the ninth hour of the night, so great a light shone round the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime, which lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes as to pretend those events that followed immediately upon it. At the same festival also a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. Moreover, the east gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass and vastly heavy and had been with difficulty shut by 20 men, rested upon the basis arm with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord at the sixth hour of the night. Now those that kept watch in the temple came hereupon, running to the captain of the temple, and told him of it. The temple, the temple, the doors of the temple are opened. Who then came up thither, and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to the vulgar to be a very happy prodigy, as if God had thereupon opened them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of his own accord, and that the gate was open for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Besides these, a few days after the feast, on the one and the twentieth day of the month, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomena appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding of cities. Moreover, at that feast which was called Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great voice. And after that, they heard a sound of a great multitude, saying, Let us remove from hence. But what is still more terrible, there was one Jesus, the son of Ananus, a plebeian, and a husbandman, who four years before the war began, and at the time when the city was in very great peace and prosperity, came to that feast whereon it was our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to God in the temple, began on a sudden to cry aloud, A voice in the east! A voice 
in the west. A voice from the four winds. A voice against Jerusalem and the holy house. A voice against the bridegrooms and the brides. And a voice against this whole people. And this was his cry as he went about by day and by night in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his and took upon the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did not he either say anything for himself or anything peculiar to those that chastise him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Hereupon our rulers, supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped until his bones were laid bare. Yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible at every stroke of the whip, his answer was, Woe, woe to Jerusalem! When Albinus, for he was then our procurator, asked him who he was, and whence he came, and why he uttered such words, he made no manner of reply to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty till Albinus took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now, during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was seen by them while he said so. But he every day uttered these lamentable words as if it were his premeditated vow. Woe, woe to Jerusalem! Neither did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his reply to all men, and indeed, no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months, without growing hoarse or being tired therewith, until the very time that he saw this presage Whoa. in earnest Whoa, fulfilled. General Vespasian delegated responsibility of sacking the city of Jerusalem to his son, General Titus. Whereupon, before laying waste to the city and its inhabitants, the historian Tacitus reflected on the rumored origins of the inhabitants of Jerusalem when he wrote, Many again say that they were a race of Ethiopian origin, who in the time of King Cephas were driven by fear and hatred of their neighbors to seek a new dwelling place. Others describe them as an Assyrian horde, who not having sufficient territory, took possession of part of Egypt and founded cities of their own in what is called the Hebrew country, lying on the borders of Syria. You see, during this time, not only were the ancient Israelites considered to be Ethiopians, who are black, which matches the depictions of the people of Judah with short, nappy, woolly hair seen on the Lakes relief found in the London Museum. The depiction of Judah as an Ethiopian type people is also confirmed in the cranial analysis of Judah's Lakes skulls, which describe Judean skulls as Egypto Nubian. We also find that Tacitus also describes an ancient Syrian as black. As the following reference reads and reads, but there was one whose name was Sabinus, a soldier that served among the cohorts and a Syrian by birth, who appeared to be of very great fortitude, both in the actions he had done and the courage of his soul he had shown. Although anybody would have thought before he came to his work that he was of such a weak constitution of body that he was not fit to be a soldier for his color was black. The following account of the fall of Jerusalem details the final moments before the destruction of the great city and Yahuwah's temple. These were the last moments before the forefathers 
of the so-called African Americans were expelled from their homes. As the following reference reads and reads, Jerusalem was built on two mountains and surrounded by three walls on every side except where it was enclosed with deep valleys which were deemed inaccessible. Each wall was fortified by high towers. The celebrated temple and the strong castle of Anatolia were on the east side of the city and directly opposite to the Mount of Olives. Notwithstanding the prodigious strength of this famed metropolis, the infatuated Jews brought on their own destruction by their intestine contest. In other words, family, they were fighting among themselves as the Roman army approached. And it reads, at a time when a formidable army was rapidly advancing, the Jews were assembling from all parts to keep the Passover. The contending factions were continually inventing new methods of mutual destruction. And in their ungoverned fury, they wasted and destroyed such vast quantities of provisions as might have preserved the city many years. 70 AD. Such was the miserable situation of Jerusalem when Titus began his march towards it with a formidable army. And having laid waste the country in his progress and slaughtered the inhabitants, arrived before its walls. The sight of the Romans produced a temporary reconciliation among the contending factions that they unanimously resolved to oppose the common enemy. Let them come. We will break this shit. Their first sally was accordingly made with such fury and resolution that though Titus displayed uncommon valor on this occasion, the besiegers were obliged to abandon their camps and flee to the mountains. No sooner had the Jews a short interval of quiet from their foreign enemies than their civil disorders were renewed. John, by an impious stratagem, found means to cut off or force Eleazar's men to submit to him, and the factions were again reduced to two, who opposed each other with impeccable animosity. The Romans, in the meantime, exerted all their energy in making preparation for a powerful attack upon Jerusalem. Trees were cut down, houses were leveled, rocks cleft asunder, and valleys filled up. Towers were raised and battering rams erected with other engines of destruction against the devoted city. After the offers of peace, which Titus had repeatedly sent by Josephus, were rejected with indignation, the Romans began to play their engines with all their might. The strenuous attacks of the enemy again united the contending parties within the walls, who had also engines which they plied with uncommon fury. They had taken lately from Cetius, but were so ignorant of their use, they did little execution while the Roman legions made terrible havoc. The rebels were soon compelled to retire from the ponderous stones, which they threw incessantly from the towers they had erected, and the battering rams were at full liberty to play against the walls. A breach was soon made in it, at which the Romans entered and encamped in the city while the Jews retreated behind the second enclosure. The victorious immediately advanced to the second wall and plied their engines and battering rams so furiously that one of the towers they had erected began to shake. And the Jews who occupied it, perceiving their impending ruin, set it on fire and precipitated themselves into flames. The fall of this structure gave the Romans an entrance into the second enclosure. They were, however, repulsed by the besieged. We make our last stand here. Hold the line. Push them back. For Yahuwah! But at length regained the place entirely and prepared for attacking the third and inner wall. The vast number of people which were enclosed in Jerusalem occasioned a famine which raged in a terrible manner. And as their calamities increased, the fury of the zealots if possible rose to a greater height. They forced open the houses of their fellow citizens in search of provisions. If they found any, they acquiesced tortures upon them under pretense that they had food concealed. The nearest relations in the extreme hunger snatched the food from each other. Josephus, 
who was an eyewitness of the unparalleled sufferings of the Jews experienced during the siege of their metropolis remarked that all the calamities that had ever befell any nation since the beginning of the world were inferior to the miseries of my countrymen. Thus, we see the exact fulfillment of the emphatic words of our Savior respecting the great tribulation in Jerusalem. Titus, who was apprised of the wretched condition, relaxed the siege four days, and being still desirous of saving the city, caused the provisions to be distributed to his army in the sight of the Jews, who flocked upon the walls to behold him. Josephus was next sent to his countrymen to attempt to persuade them not to plunge themselves in inevitable ruin by persisting in defense of a place which could hold out but little longer, and which the Romans looked upon as already their own. He exhorted them in the most pathetic terms to save themselves, their temple, and their country, and painted in strong colors the fatal effects which would result from their obstinacy. But the people, after many bitter invectives, began to dart their arrows at him. Yet he continued to address them with greater vehemence, and many were induced by his eloquence to run the utmost risk in order to escape the Romans, while others became more desperate and resolved to hold out to the last extremity. The Jews, who were forcibly seized by the Romans without the walls, and who made the utmost resistance for fear of punishment, were scourged and crucified near the city. Famine made them so daring in these excursions that 500 and sometimes more suffered this dreadful death every day. And on account of the number, Josephus observed that space was wanted for the crosses and the crosses for the captives. And yet, contrary to Titus' intention, the seditious Jews were not disposed to a surrender by these horrid spectacles. In order to cheek desertion, they represented the sufferers as supplants and not as men taken by resistance. Yet, even some who deemed the capital punishment inevitable escape to the Romans considered death by the hands of their enemies, a desirable refuge when compared with the complicated distress which they endured. In order to accelerate the destined ruin of Jerusalem, Titus discouraged and exacerbated by the repeated destruction of his engines and towers, undertook the artist's task of enclosing the city with a strong wall in order to prevent the inhabitants from receiving any succor from the adjacent country, or eluding his vengeance by flight. Such was the preserving spirit of the soldiers that in three days they enclosed the city by a wall nearly five miles in circle. Thus was the prophecy of our Savior accomplished. The day shall come upon thee, when thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in on every side. Upon this the famine raged with augmented violence, and destroyed whole families, while Jerusalem inhabited a horrid spectacle of emaciated invalids and putrescent bodies. The dead were too numerous to be interred and many expire in the performance of this office. The public calamity was too great for lamentation and the silence of the unutterable woe overspread the city. The Romans having pursued the attack with the utmost rigor, advanced their last engines against the walls after having converted into a desert, for wood to construct them, a country well planted and interspersed with gardens for more than 11 miles round the city. They scaled the inner wall and after a sanguinary encounter, made themselves masters of the fortress Antonia. Still, however, not only the zealots, but many of the people were yet so blinded that though nothing was now left but the temple and the Romans were making formidable preparation to batter it down, they could not persuade themselves that God would suffer that holy place to be taken by heathens, but still expected a miraculous deliverance. And though the war was advancing towards the temple, they themselves burnt the portico, which joined it to Antonia, 
which occasioned Titus to remark that they began to destroy with their own hands that magnificent edifice which he had preserved. When Josephus was sent for the last time to John, who commanded in the temple to upbraid him for obstinately exposing that sacred building and the miserable remains of God's people to inevitable destruction, he answered with the bitterest invectives, adding that he was defending the Lord's vineyard, which he was sure could not be taken by any human force. Perhaps John should have read Isaiah chapter 5, verse 5, which reads, And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of Yahuwah of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression. For righteousness, behold a cry. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In my ears, said Yahuwah of hosts, of truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without habitation. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of a homer shall yield an ephah. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continueth until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp and the viol and tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast. But they regard not the work of Yahuwah, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude dried up with thirst. And continuing our reference, which reads, When Josephus was sent for the last time to John, who commanded in the temple to upbraid him for obstinately exposing that sacred building and the miserable remains of God's people to inevitable destruction, he answered with the bitterest invectives, adding that he was defending the Lord's vineyard, which he was sure could not be taken by any human force. Yet this monster, had not scrupled to plunder the temple of a large quantity of its golden utensils and the magnificent gifts of kings, which he converted to his own use. He also seized the sacred oil, which was to maintain the lamps, and even used to intoxicate himself and his party with the wine, which is intended for sacrifice. On the 17th of July, the daily sacrifice ceased for the first time since its restoration by the brave Judas Maccabeus, there being no proper person left to make the offering. Titus upbraided the zealots for neglecting their worship and challenged them to leave the temple and fight on more proper ground in order to preserve that sacred edifice from the fury of his troops. But as they persisted in their inflexible obstinacy, Titus, after several bloody engagements, took position of the outward court of the Gentiles and forced the besieged into that of the priest. The Roman commander had determined in council not to burn the temple. Considering the existence of so proud a structure an honor to himself, he therefore attempted to batter down one of the galleries of the precinct. But as the strength of the wall eluded the force of all his engines, his troops next endeavored to scale it but were repulsed with considerable loss. When Titus found that his desire of saving the sacred building was likely to cost many lives, he set fire to the gates of the outer temple, which being plated with silver, burnt all night, and the flame rapidly communicated to the adjacent galleries and porticos. Now listen fam, it says, Titus who was still desirous of preserving the temple, caused the flames to be extinguished appeased the clamors of his troops who vehemently insisted on the necessity of raising it to the ground 
as we hold our place here, family, let's turn to Psalms 137, verse 7, to see who it was that said, raise it, raise it to the ground. So remember, Josephus said that it was General Titus's troops that said, raise it, raise it to the ground. However, in the Bible, in Psalms chapter 137, verse 7, the Bible gives a name to the people who said, raise it, raise it to the ground. And it reads, remember, O Yahuwah, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. Listen, fam, it says, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dashes thy little ones against the stone. So as you can see, the Bible calls the people who said, raise it, raise it to the ground. The Bible identifies those people as Edom, as the daughter of Babylon. The utmost exertions of Titus to save the temple were, however, ineffectual. Our savior had foretold its total destruction and his awful prediction was about to be accomplished. And now, says Josephus, the fatal day approached in the revolution of ages, the 10th of August, emphatically called the day of vengeance, in which the first temple had been destroyed by the king of Babylon. While Titus was reposing himself in his pavilion, a Roman soldier, without receiving any command, seized some of the blazing materials and with the assistance of another soldier who raised him from the ground, threw them through a window into one of the apartments that surrounded the sanctuary. The whole north side up to the third floor was immediately enveloped in flames. The Jews who now began to suppose heaven had forsaken them, rushed in with violent lamentations and spared no effort, not even life itself, to preserve the sacred edifice on which they had rested their security. Titus, being awakened by the outcry, hastened to the spot and commanded his soldiers to exert themselves to the utmost to extinguish the fire. He called, he urged and threatened his men, but so great was the clamor and the tumult that his entreaties and menaces were alike disregarded. The exasperated Romans who resorted thither from the camp were engaged either in increasing conflagration or killing the Jews. The dead were heaped about the altar and a stream of blood flowed at its depths. Still, as the flames had not reached the inner part of the temple, Titus with some of his chief officers entered the sanctuary in most holy place which excited his astonishment and admiration. After having in vain repeated his attempts to prevent its destruction, he saved the golden candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of perfumes, which were all of pure gold, and the volume of the law, wrapped up in a rich golden tissue. Upon his leaving the sacred place, some other soldiers set fire to it. After tearing off the golden plating, from the gates and timber work. A horrid massacre soon followed, in which prodigious multitudes perished, while others rushed in a kind of frenzy into the midst of the flames and precipitated themselves from the battlements of their falling temple. 6,000 persons who, deluded by a false prophet with hopes of a miracle, of a miraculous deliverance, had fled to a gallery yet standing without the temple perished at once by the relentless barbarity of the soldiers who set it on fire and suffered none to escape. The conquerors carried their fury to such a height as to massacre all they met without distinction of age, sex, or quality. They also burnt all the treasure houses containing vast quantities of money, plate, and the richest furniture. In a word, they continued to mark their progress with fire and sword till they had destroyed all except two of the temple gates and that part of the court which was destined for the women. When the sword had returned to its scabbard for want of objects were on to exercise its fury and the troops were satisfied with plunder, 
Titus commanded the whole city and temple to be demolished. Upon viewing the strength of the works, he exclaimed, we have fought with the assistance of God. It was God who drove the Jews out of these fortifications. For what can the hands of men or the force of machines effect against these towers? In order to give posterity an idea of the strength of the city and the astonishing valor of its conquerors, he preserved the highest towers, Phasaelus, Hippicus, and Marim, in a part of the wall which surrounded Jerusalem to the west. All the other circuit of the city was so leveled as not to leave those who approached it any proof that it ever had been inhabited. It is recorded in the Talmud and by Maimonides that Terentius Rufus plowed up the foundations of the temple. Thus were our Savior's prophecies fulfilled. Thy enemies shall lay thee even with the ground, and there shall not be left one stone upon another. And so the descendants of Edom destroyed the Most High Yah's temple and burned it to the ground, going as far as to dig up the very foundation stones of his holy temple in an attempt to erase any evidence of its existence, which explains why Yahuwah's judgment against Edom is sometimes referred to as the vengeance of his temple. Oh yes, Yahuwah is prophesied to pay Esau back in what's called the day of the Lord. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 8 reads, Shall I not in that day, says Yahuwah, even destroy the wise man out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau, and thy mighty man, O Teman, shall be dismayed, to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. And the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that strangers carried away captive his foes, and foreigners entered into his gate, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother, and the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither should have thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. And so family, Esau's days are numbered and the Most High will pay him back in full. And with that family, thank you for taking the time to watch and support. Thank you for those who continue to lift me and my family and the whole house of Israel up in your thoughts and prayers and thank you for those who continue to share these videos with your family and friends well israel hope you enjoyed it stay blessed and shalom